Hi there, Lynn Christian from Soul Salt, where we coach people how to be strong and true and focused. And today what we're going to do is interview Judy Morris, who is the Executive VP, should say Senior Vice President of HR Progression, which is a debt management company here in Salt Lake City. Over the past 12 months, I've had the honor of working with Judy and her team on a cultural transformation engagement where we've blended group coaching with individual and virtual coaching application of the concepts that we're trying to engage within the entire culture to facilitate the transformation. She is a very astute leader. She's heart and soul and intelligence. She's one part savvy, one part grit, and one part wise, wise woman. I hope that you enjoy her interview where we talk about some of the tactics and strategies of how to do cultural transformation, which include things like trust, modeling behaviors, measuring one step at a time and making it okay for people to make mistakes. She'll also give her greatest um, tidbit of advice for anyone that's an executive. And she's going to talk to us about a couple of the program, the lead program and the women in leadership program that we instigated within the culture so that there was a platform for transformation in coaching, in training, and in networking and communicating within small groups and large groups within the organization. I hope you enjoy this uh, interview and can take a few notes on how to make your cultural transformation occur. Enjoy. Well, there have been some interviews that I have uh, completed in the last year that I was excited about. I don't think there's one that I'm more excited about than this one. There are oh. some that I'm equally excited about, but today we get to sit with a leader, Judy Morris, who is one of the up and coming female thought leaders in our area here in Salt Lake City. She is a senior VP of HR. She's a world traveler. She has an unconventional path that I'm gonna ask her to share of how she got to where she is. And the topic we're gonna to cover today with, with her is this. We're gonna talk about cultural transformation and we're also gonna talk about some of the activities and strategies that she's engaged in to make cultural transformation occur. So welcome, Judy. Thank you, great to be here. And I'm going to just have you jump in and give a bit of your story arc and, and connect the dots of where you started and how you got to your VP. Well, I like to start with where I was born because I think uh, it's, it's informative of how we come up. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. I spent the first 18 years and maybe one day or two weeks uh, there. Um, I had no real interest in going to college out of high school. I managed restaurants and um, had a real connection to the community of workers that I found in the job, um, whatever job I was in, and ultimately stayed uh, the course there and worked hard, but made my way into a community college pretty quickly. It was two years, uh, I was 20, and found out that I wrote well. And then you couldn't get me out of college. I got an undergrad in uh, philosophy, one in English uh, language, one in literature, and most of my master's in aesthetic studies. I ended up becoming a international freelance journalist for travel magazines off and on for 10 years. I taught high school English. Um, and when I moved back from Austria just over 20 some odd years ago, I had no interest in doing any of the things that I had done. Um, applied for a job that said you must write well, and it was outplacement um, for writing resumes for senior level and executive managers. And from there, I ended up getting a job in recruiting, which I'd done a fair amount of in the restaurant business. And ultimately, I learned uh, in the six years that I stayed with the first company I was with, every different facet of HR, from training, learning and development, to all of the functional areas of HR. And I would say that um, never having intention to move up in HR or in a company 
or never having my eye on the next job. It served me well because what ended up happening was that uh, my work ethic and my connective tissue to the other people I worked with in that moment always provided me the next opportunity. And lo and behold, I looked up one day and realized there really wasn't a promotion as I was sitting in the top HR seat. It wasn't by design that I came here, but by, um, I think, the application of hard work and a fair amount of luck and opportunity that opened its way to me. What a brilliant story. And uh, one of the common bonds we have is we did take a stint of a teaching school in a public school for a while. And so when people hear that, sometimes I don't know how it is with you, but they kind of look at me like, well, how did you make the jump to business? And to me, it was a natural jump. I mean, education and managing workloads with students is synonymous with managing workloads with people in business. I, I think that's right. Um, and I also think it's true that one's ability to be able to connect with people through your communication skills and through, um, through educating sometimes yourself in the process is probably served me better in business than any other single skill. I would agree. I think that's a really good thing to piggyback on there. And I know when I was hired, I was hired because I had writing skills mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that could be in my, my resume with articles. And they also like the instructional design background and the communication is yeah key. You and I both know that the quality of a culture is dependent upon the quality of the relationships, which depends on the conversations you have, you don't have, and the way you have them or the reasons that you don't have them. So let's translate everything then with this brilliant story arc over to how would you define Judy, how do you define cultural transformation? What does that mean in your book? Well, it's interesting. It, it begs the question that something needs to be transformed and that would indicate that it's not just right or perfect now. And I think that the variety of companies I've stepped into all fall into that category. I think every company does. There's always better to be had. And the CEO that I'm working with now um, has that gold standard where, how do we do? It was good. We could do better. We can always do better. So when you think about defining cultural transformation, it's uh, a, an honest evaluation of where the organization is now, where it wants to go in the future, and what needs to be done to get it there. And that... Um, that really honest, open evaluation of strengths and skills includes the pieces and parts that are either non-existent or weak muscles that need to be built, supplemented, um, and uh, stretched. And I think cultural change, for the most part, in any organization is to drive performance. And so having uh, some set of guiding principles, values, and a clear view of what the mission of the organization is probably includes some um, very clearly identified and articulated performance management model that says, here's what good looks like, here's where we want to go, and here's what we want that to look like. Mm. It's really well said. So maybe you can give some examples of the sorts of things you see happening in cultures that you've worked in where transformation was an opportunity to look at or even grab onto. So when I think about, let's take a cultural value that our, my current organization works hard to um, perpetuate, but I think also model that's not so easy is um, one that is founded in our value around integrity, mm. is also founded and associated with our um, consumer advocacy value, but it's really about transparency. And transparency is an interesting thing to aspire to. It's a really tough one though, because think about it from the performance management model. 
We want to set really clear expectations. We want to give really open, honest, timely, actionable feedback in order to have the close the gap between what we expect and the outcomes we're driving. But that requires skill. And it isn't just on the part of the person setting the expectations or giving the feedback. It includes a community of people, uh, both uh, up, down, and around, that have the ability to receive that feedback, and and further upstream to ask clarifying questions and to push back when expectations are either unrealistic or unsupported with from a resource perspective. Mm. But when you think about associating. Um, driving transformational change, really you have to strip it back to the studs and foundationally look at values, look at and understand what you're trying to accomplish and make sure that there is a supporting integration and that you don't have competing priorities undermining your ability to be able to drive forward in really what, what gets to be pretty deep mud. Um, as we enter mud season, it's pretty, it gets pretty deep pretty quickly if you aren't um, accounting holistically for the challenges ahead. Well, well said. So I don't know if you want to divulge which company you work for or if you can even get specific about a cultural change and shift that you and the CEO are currently making, but if you feel good about that, you're welcome to bring that up. So in, in the spirit of being um, transparent, absolutely 100%, um, I'm currently uh, very happy to be leading the HR charge here at Progression. Um, we are in financial services and support people's financial well-being and uh, improving financial landscape picture. We do credit repair, credit support, um, credit care. And we have, I've been with the company uh, two years this month, and I'm fortunate enough to have a leader who partners very closely with me on, um, on any number of things, but there is uh, absolute alignment on the um, understanding that we have to be driving toward uh, an inclusive environment. So we're a very performance-driven metrics uh, KPI um, organization that uh, we have a 125 uh, slide deck that we go through every week with the executives. So we both are strategic and fly high and all of us are far enough down in the weeds that we can speak to the details of the business at what often others who are interviewing with us find to be an obnoxious and way too detail uh, oriented um, uh, view of how you run a business. That said, we're headquartered in Salt Lake. We work in a pretty conservative community. We're in the financial industry, we, um, which is in and of itself fairly um, conservative as well uh, from a history standpoint. And so some of what we are looking to do is, like every other company, attract and retain top talent. And in order to do that, we've got to have an environment where there's room for us all, where inclusion is, um, is systemic. And I mean that in a way that says there's a number of different ways to go about showing up at work and that you've got to be able to bring yourself, not yourself, but your self to the story. So you talked a little, we talked a little bit about what it means to bring your story to work. And that was one of the things that we built foundationally, our leadership programs and our women in leadership in specific. And when I think about that inclusion model, it supports the ability to be able to attract all sorts of different people, but you have to have a fair and equitable work environment, a culture that rewards and recognizes people of all um, 
uh, of all, whatever, fill in the blank, what comes after that. And that's how you drive top talent. That's how you create the kind of culture where those people who are performance oriented want to stay. So I know two initiatives that you have going on. One is to grow the leadership, to level it up. And that's the LEAD program. And with a desire that right from the very get-go, as you mentioned, the CEO is a maximizer who we can do great and now let's go exceptional. We can do well and good, now let's go to great. So he's, he's uh, an individual who can acknowledge success and then ask what's next. And so he's asked that of general leadership also, you have looked at cultural change through women in leadership, realizing that in a conservative city, in a conservative industry, there are fewer females in leadership within this industry. And so that's been a topic of actual focus. So uh, what were some of the, you know, if you're, you're looking for this cultural shift to have different mindsets, different races, different backgrounds, different orientations, a, a, a diverse group that's inclusive, not just diverse for diversity's sake, but it's inclusive and cohesive. What are the strategies and activities that you've been a part of that you feel have been successful when working toward cultural shifts? You know, the the thing, the primary one that keeps rising to the top of my list is modeling. And uh, it does indeed start at the top. I think the thing that is, um, when it's absent, it's cultural transformation doesn't happen. It can't happen because there isn't the airspace created in the room or in the organization to be able to fuel that kind of change. And when I say modeling um, behavior, it's really the top of the organization, not only giving lip service and speaking to it, but that there are, um, there are specific actions that can be pointed to toward uh, and, and you know, identified as how you do this, for example. Um, in order to be able to encourage people to take risks and um, make mistakes, you have to reward and recognize mistakes that are made. And it can't just be when it's convenient, and it can't just be when it's um, uh, less impactful to the organization. Uh, I've watched and helped encourage uh, this organization to do just that when we get uncomfortable, when we hire people who challenge us and our comfort level, knowing and understanding that to be inclusive means to uh, change the landscape and get uncomfortable. Wow. And um, so, so one of the strategies is having a very specific tactical plan in place where you are checking in you are supporting, you're encouraging, you're recognizing, rewarding the leaders who then have to turn around and um, support and facilitate the inclusion of those folks on their teams. And that's something that we've done. Um, and it's tough. It's not easy because people who are don't look like us or sound like us, who don't have the same um, out, outside of work, perhaps, or the same kind of community roots, or the same routines are, are not making us feel comfortable, and yet reaching out and supporting their, um, their choices in, in a very public kind of way at work has really helped us to inch forward. It's been, it feels like it's uh, progress in inches, not miles. But when you step back, it's, it's a war um, of, uh, you, you get there, it's feet, you're making progress. And um, ultimately, you have to measure uh, starting with where you begin, not with where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Because you, you, you change is slow. And um, it is to sometimes it's two steps forward and one back. And sometimes you have to flip that. And it's 
one step forward and two back. So yeah. what you really have to do in the same way from a business perspective, all I did was, was remind our, our leadership how we manage the business is while we track KPIs and we even in particularly in the sales center here at Progression, we track KPIs, but we coach to behaviors because we firmly believe that if we coach to the behaviors, we'll get to the KPIs. All I did was remind people, our leadership, that we had this model and this is the way we drive change. We measure how many women, how many different kinds of um, diverse individuals do we have on leadership teams, how far down in the work, what are we driving toward. Now, what are the behaviors and the behavioral changes that will get us to different KPIs? Let's focus on those and not that we're not tracking, not that we're not looking, but we're coaching to behaviors because we trust in the fact that that's how you drive KPI changes. Okay, that's, that's a mammoth amount of information in a small moment. So I'm gonna go back and make sure that I got those points because that was an incredible bit of wisdom. One piece is behavior modeling. If we believe that this value is true, if we believe that the, these KPIs and honoring the individual is something that we stand for, if we believe in something, we model it, and we model it from the leadership on down. There are specific tactical things that we do consistently to model. We do specific measurements of those, and we start with where we are, measuring we're tolerant and sometimes it's two steps forward and three back as long as we keep working it's a almost like a growth mindset of we've gotten there or we're not yet but we're on path on track that's one of the big applied um strategies that you do what else is that your sleeve their strategic activity or something else that you believe influences and benefits cultural shifting I think um, effort counts and trying and failing is, uh, I, I think those things have to be recognized and rewarded. And um, it, it's not easy. And I think that assuming positive intent is one of, so this is one of the things that Mike uh, DeVico talks a lot about from his uh, leadership position it's really interesting to watch him model that assume positive intent because what it means is that he um, listens to connect. He asks good questions that solicit people's input that gives him the opportunity to be able to teach, to coach, to model. But if they're brave and if, if our employees, if our um, if our leaders are willing to be vulnerable, they also get a chance to make mistakes because um, trying effort, um, putting energy toward the right things and failing is also something that's okay. It's not consistently okay, but the truth is, is that if you try and put effort and you have good intent and you're listening and learning and connecting, you're most likely going to succeed. And what we found is that those are components that make up for a healthy culture. Getting people to trust, getting people to be brave, those are harder, but they come over time. And consistency is one of the things that ultimately is maybe the greatest teacher of all because mm -hmm. you get people trying and then when they fail and you consistently give them positive reinforcement for the effort and the energy and the engagement, they will succeed. It's, we've, we, we're experiencing it here um, at, at, at Progression every single day. So I would love if you can get in without divulging um, any confidentiality. What's an example of how effort counts? And then I'm gonna have you give one, an example of assuming uh, positive intention, and then one for um, trust. So let's start with 
effort counts. What's an example of that happening in your culture as you guys are shifting the leadership and the empowerment of a diverse leadership group? Effort counts because here's an example. So I had a hiring manager. I'm going to take all the specifics out, but I had a hiring manager. Um, we have uh, fewer women and diverse uh, employees in positions of leadership. And so what we attempt to do is provide two qualified candidates that either are women or diverse candidates. Let's just put those in diverse candidates for every um, uh qualified male candidate. And we, um, inc we have made very specific um, goals. We've articulated those. We've put those out to the leadership, to the hiring managers. We were in the process of hiring somebody at a director level, and we um, were doing our two-to-one qualified candidates. And I was speaking with the hiring manager who had interviewed a slate of candidates and uh, this individual, uh, he was really trying. He and I were debriefing on the interviews and there was a very diverse candidate who was uber qualified, but showed up in such a way as to not be a good cultural fit. I came to that um, so excited about the level of diversity with this individual. Um, and because I'd seen the resume, there was clearly the qualifications there. But I also trust this individual that they were trying and they, they identified why, he, he just said, here are the three reasons why I don't believe they'd be a good fit and they wouldn't be successful here. And it was enough that he was willing to interview particularly this one very, very diverse candidate, and we moved along. His intent entered and his effort gave them a fair shake. And I had to trust that. I had to enter and listen and really connect with the information that he was putting out. And ultimately, I, I, I believe that was the right decision not to bring this individual into the company. It, it's not the outcome we're driving for is to drive diversity. What we're really, the, the, the thing we're really trying to, to happen here um, at, at Progression is to drive uh, a level of um, cultural excellence where we really include everybody, where we create trust and we encourage engagement at that level. So you rewarded this HR individual, this person on your team, you rewarded the person on your team with allowing their decision to stand and let their effort count because they'd done their due diligence and they could explain it to you. And it wasn't a head count that you were hiring for diversity. It was an outcome that you were hiring for and his effort matched, matched the outcome. Yeah, that's right. Okay, assuming positive intent. That seems to be a strategy you guys are using, and I've seen you do it. In fact, Mike, the CEO that we, you've spoken of earlier, the, he has some favorite stories he tells around assuming positive intent. What's an example of that that's moving the shift toward this cultural shift? It, it's so prevalent and he brings it up so often. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull one example out. Um, I'm trying to think off the cuff. Well, here's an example you just gave us. Yeah. He brings it up enough. So it's one of those things where if you believe in something, you can't just say it once. He believes in it. He stated it. He tells stories. He reinforces it at the table. So I think if you really believe in something, Beyond modeling behavior, what I've seen with you and with Mike is you keep reiterating and you show what you mean, you tell what you mean, and you repeat what you mean. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. And I would tell you, I can give any number of examples where I uh, walk in, I might be wrapped around the axle about this or that, and he will encourage me by asking, well, what do you think they were trying to accomplish? What do you think 
you know, fi finish the question, but he will ask the question that clearly uh, indicates the underlying question is, assume positive intent. What do you put yourself in their shoes and tell me what do you think happened that uh, led them to this action? As opposed to the backstory, oh, the stories we tell ourselves in the absence of fact, we've created this big, but instead, what if we assume positive intent, then what's the story? And so what happens is the culture itself is avoiding running up some ladder of conclusions That's right. and becoming far more objective. So let's move to trust, because this is something that we worked on together with the leadership group. What role does trust play in cultural transformation? There has to be the kind of trust among, um, not only among the leaders, but it starts there. Back to my comments about modeling, if the leaders aren't modeling the trust behaviors and the connection between themselves, there's no way the organization is gonna look to either any individual leader or leadership in general and to trust um, and, and, and to, to be trustful. A specific example of how an organization and or a leader generates and puts uh, the trust uh, coins into the bank of a company and its culture is really by be having integrity. Mm -hmm. And I always think of that as one of my values, but it's maybe it's first uh, on the wall outside of my office. And so I'm always pointing to the wall outside my office saying the way in which you gain trust and build a trusting culture is to have integrity. That means being honest and telling the truth, even when it's icky. And it's not by uh, just commission that you may be dishonest, but omission. You, when there is information to be shared in the pool of, um, of knowledge, you, you, you have to include things that uh, oftentimes are crucial conversations. They're challenging and um, they're not easy to have. Yeah. And, and the integrity needed to be able to be honest means that you also have to be transparent. And those are tough things to do in a business world where moving quickly, you have to own mistakes and you have to own failures and you have to be willing to allow other people to own theirs. Well, I say amen to that because the work that we did with the lead group and we touched upon a little bit with the women in leadership was about transparency, telling the truth. When there's a difficult conversation, can you use the conversational intelligence essentials of direct, refocus, reframe, and find ways that are palatable to say the hard thing so that people can hear, get under your umbrella, you get under theirs, and actually find mutual success after. So, um, so I'm going to leave a bookmark here. If you want to come back and tell some more specific strategies and activities, I'd love to hear those. I feel like our could get a maybe a snapshot of what we created over the past 12 months together in the lead program because I think that was a stellar example, Judy, of co-creating between your office and my my office what we could do to build the leaders as a ground zero. Here's here's just level one, and you saw now we're in year two of women in leadership. I think those two initiatives are really driving some of this change. So what do you want to say to those two programs? Yeah, so I, I, I would agree with you. I think that um, they are helping us to drive the change. You can't hope to have the change without having a plan. Hope is not a plan. Um, when I came on board, there was a lead program that was for um, above the line level, up to about a uh, senior manager, some assistant directors participated. But that lead program was for that uh, middle management layer, and it was fabulous. It had been in place for three or four years, and it was um, targeted specifically for them, and it was a great investment. And for a company that's been around for coming up on 20 years, it was a really good sort of 
table stakes kind of how do you develop your your frontline and uh, next level leaders. Right. But what was missing was the senior leaders, the top 100 or so uh, leaders in the company had never had a targeted program. And if in fact cultural transformation starts at the top, you've got to be have you've got to focus uh, a program programmatically, systematically. I think you have to target that group, or your your you you have your uh, line level and next next level leaders watching their leaders not develop. And so there is that modeling for sure, but it's also very intentional. And so one of the things we did was sit down with you, Lynn, and say, from a competency standpoint, what are the core and key competencies that, that create culture and that help us to shift and change culture as we look to be more intentional about where we're headed um, with uh, our, our culture transformation? And those were the CIQ kind of um, pieces and parts. They're communication tools, strategies. We learned about double clicking. We learned about listening to connect. And if you get into a conversation and you have the um, very intentioned mindset that you need to listen to connect, and you have with it a tactic that says double click on something that either you don't understand or want to learn more about that you believe will help you and that person get from a level two conversation to a level three conversation um, and or help you move your way down the ladder of conclusions so that you can stay in the conversation long enough to be able to get past some icky parts. It's, it's transformational. That kind of you know, long term, we, we, we had groups, uh, cohorts of 20 launch and stay in it for seven very intense months where they not only met every other week, um, first in person and then through Zoom, but weekly had home plays where they were working out the application of concepts learned like double click, like the ladder of conclusions, and then applying them and codifying those where they could, um, they could demonstrate for themselves and for those around them, above them, below them, and peer groups, where they got a chance to demonstrate, I remember how to learn, I know how to lead, and in fact, I'm really good at this one, or here's a gap, I can be better, do better. And that created opportunities for vulnerability and tran, you know, being transparent and demonstrating and living our values. Well, I think that was one of the best um, recaps of what we did um, because the, the key was on working out the application of principles. And what we designed together was if we're gonna level up the leadership to be part of this cultural shift, which is, one part productivity and one part let's do this together let's find out how to strengthen the culture we used the focus on building leadership capacity as, as the focal point and the vehicle was conversational intelligence and how to talk to people and how to up your finesse mm -hmm. and your sophistication of leadership by the level of conversations you could facilitate engage in and participate in and even initiate. So I think what you said was fabulous. Give us just a snapshot of the women in leadership program because to me that's a, a crown in or a jewel in the crown of of the workmanship that you've brought into the organization as well. Well thank you. I, I it it takes a village and when we came to you looking for some help with the women in leadership, I think the first year I was like we got this, we can do this in-house. And it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. It wasn't what we uh, wanted to do for another year. And so what we have done over the course of the last year with the Women in Leadership, um, with your help and participation, is to, I'm gonna just call out one of the things that we did with the women. 
uh, one, one of the, the monthly um, sessions was around values. So think about the concept of inclusion and there's room for us all and helping people. It's learning um, that is experiential is 10x more powerful. So you put, you put us through a, um, an exercise that helped each one of us individually and then also collectively identify what are our, individually, what, Judy, what are my um, top three values? It's a powerful exercise. We go from, you know, um, 50 to 10 to five to three and then one. And what ended up happening out of that was that here we have six values for the progression company core cultural um, uh, value system. We allowed the women in our organization to be able to see themselves in both a different way and experience the um, coming together and bringing uh, their them themselves and their self to this collection of values i feel confident and in large part because i heard back from so many women as did you lynn that whatever one they landed on there was some analogous um uh, counterpoint here in the six values with the company and so what i think came most salient out of that conversation, that learning session, was that the women of this organization found out that there really is space and place for them here. The true application. And mm -hmm. that's, again, an, an almost an embodiment of the uh, modeling mm -hmm. of what we say, you know, this integrity is our words are congruent with our actions. Our yeah. words are congruent with what we're asking you to embody. So I'm going to kind of draw us closer to our conclusion in respect of, of your time. Uh, two things. We can go back to the bookmark. Is there any other strategy or activity that's come to mind that you want to share? And after that, what would be your best piece of advice to anyone else in a leadership position who's worked with cultural transformation? Uh, so I guess the only th other thing I'd add is that one of the things that we um, we did is is a brought in the storytelling and we we narrative is so important because it gives us a way to bring our true selves and our story to bear in an environment and if you have an environment where people are welcome uh, feel comfortable to bring their story, they have the opportunity to all be teachers and tellers as well as to listen to connect and to use their communication strengths to bond and uh, form that way forward. But I think it also allow, has allowed us to come around a campfire of sorts that, that to, we are building a fire to attract and retain those top talent. But we have to provide, um, I think, the, the, the space to make some mores and to sit back and listen and invite our elders, which are all of, you know, what, invite our elders forward. And by inviting them to tell their stories, we have others who are moving into place and telling their stories. And there is this communal well-being that, you know, um, happens around the warmth of a culture that is really, it becomes very inclusive just by nature of, yeah, it's messy and life is messy, but there's an inclusiveness that happens when we are, we let those guards down and begin to tell those stories. So that would be the only thing, um, ultimately that I would add that we've done is, is focus on the narrative. I think it's an important component of what we've done and what we need to continue to do. I agree. I was firsthand in hearing a story by one of your leaders that talked about a personal story about his relationship with his father and he was very transparent. And then within a month and a half of turning that story in, he shared just a week ago how he was again dealing with something he became transparent again 
This time he played um, some of Brene Brown's videos about shame and vulnerability to his team. He became, again, vulnerable about something, let them in on what was happening and the outpouring of support, common story, connection. Uh, as Matt Lieberman talks about in his book, Social, we are primitively wired for connection. He was using story to connect lesson, connectivity between people, deepening relationship. I test that the storytelling has been an astute addition to the cultural mm -hmm. transformation and continues to be a means by which it is occurring. Uh, what's your That's last piece great. of advice to anyone who's engaging in cultural transformation? Do you have a, a free piece of advice, Judy? Yeah, I, this won't surprise you. It's short and sweet, be brave. It's oh. my advice pretty much for everything. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, you have to have, uh, you have to be brave enough to really speak from deep within the place that's, you know, the small child up against the big imposing figure that's, you know, backed by the shadow and the light is, is illuminating all of your fears. It's not easy work to uh, bring forward um, what oftentimes needs to be changed and being inclusive and driving a cultural change where people feel comfortable to share their stories, be vulnerable, make mistakes. It takes people modeling brave behavior on the outset and inviting others to, to the fire. And I, I think be brave is always good advice. I love that. Such great advice. So if people wanted to connect with you, because I know there will be people who will be extremely impressed and want to interface in some way with you. Is it LinkedIn? Is it email? How could people get in touch with you, Judy, if they wanted to connect? They should just email me at jmorris at progression with an X, P-R-O-G-R-E-X-I-O-N.com. I'm always happy to get another email. I oh, love it. I love it. You truly are a, a woman of your word. And I am so grateful that you gave us this time. I know there will be female leaders, male leaders, diverse leaders everywhere listening and learning from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. My pleasure.